And the Carter Jenkins Center will present today a lecture <coughs> on the problems of inpatient units for children, an examination of such situations that occur and the problems that take place in general in inpatient units for children, and a system called the primary caretake system that was implemented, as I will tell you in a moment, many years ago, for the first time at the University of Michigan, that you have a person that is talking to you. So let's move on. And here we have the first slide to talk about these problems of inpatient units for children and the primary caretaker system solution. And there are a number of considerations that I want to discuss before we enter into the proper subject of the lectures. Many of these units for children, inpatient units for children, are a business with all the implications that running a business has. In other words, they have to break even or make some profit, or they have to make some profit. And that influences the number of staff, the conditions of the unit, the things that happen in the unit in general, the number of nurses, etc. And that is a complication, as you will imagine. Generally, these inpatient units, on the other hand, use adult inpatient as models. So they follow the same pattern in terms of the staff, number of staff, things of that sign, and uh, of that type, things of that type. And uh, that implies as tend to happen everywhere in such units that the nursing staff is not generally trained to deal with children or training child development or know much about child psychopathology, psychopathology, family problems and, and the like. In other words, they have no training for the job that they are going to do in most cases. A brief description of one such unit that led to the primary care system, which I will talk a little more later on the lecture, uh, follows. What I mean is the following. Uh, many years ago, when I became the director of child psychiatry, at the University of Michigan, Child Adolescent Psychiatry. The program had a unit, had a hospital that was seven or eight floors tall and had been the first psychiatric hospital of its type in this country. Was uh, developed and created and originated by a chairman by the name or Raymond Wagoner, that was the chairman of psychiatry at the University of Michigan. When I became the director of that program, I took a look at the inpatient unit because there were a large number of significant and dangerous problems that were taking place. Uh, to give you an example, the children ran away from the unit with an enormous frequency. There was frequently uh, incidents that led to some form of injury that required trip to the emergency room. And there were incidents that sometimes were, as I said, extremely dangerous. In one occasion, 
one of his children uh, through a typewriter from the first floor of the hospital to the sidewalk. Luckily, nobody was hit, but as you imagine, that could have killed somebody. And there were innumerable such problems, the structure of everything that could possibly be destroyed in the unit. There was no possibility of uh, pictures or anything of any value or decorative uh, uh, things because all of them were destroyed. People, uh, fights were common and things of that kind. But I'll tell you a little more about it. So given that, I decided to create a program that I call the primary caretaker system that uh, was aimed at trying to create a healthy environment that led to enormous benefit to the children that needed to be hospitalized for whatever reason they were hospitalized. And there were certain group of children that tended to constitute the large majority of uh, children in such units. Not uncommonly, for example, we had children that were adopted children and had difficulties. A lot of conduct disorders, uh, severe oppositional defiant disorder, and very commonly and a number of children that really what they had was a DAC and they were impulsive and uh, you know difficult to control, didn't behave well at school and so on. And these were very, very common. Children of divorce were very common as well. And uh, in general, I have to say that the program uh, that was very well staffed, uh, did not at that point, in my view, have a staff that was adequately trained to deal with this kind of problems. But you will see more about this in a moment. Of course, when I tried to create this program, as you will see, it implied certain things and the hospital administrators have certain issues. Uh, when I tried to implement it in a different university later on, where the inpatient unit was not run by the university, but by a private corporation that the university has hired to do that job. And of course, they were looking at the bottom line and, and uh, we're very concerned. But I'll tell you a little more about it in a moment. Now let's talk about the primary caretaker rationale. So as I said many years ago, I implemented in the psychiatric hospital of the child and adolescent programs of the University of the Department, the Department of Psychiatry of the University of Michigan, a new functional structure for children, a structure that was based on the type of relationship that we consider necessary, indeed essential, between the children and the ward staff if a therapeutic climate was to prevail. It gradually came to be known as the primary caretaker system, a term that refers to the fact that two or three children, only two or three children, are assigned to the care of one senior staff on a permanent basis. And let me clarify 
that this units in general, certainly the one that I am referring to at this moment at the University of Michigan, was staffed essentially by a large number of nurses. And as I mentioned, they don't necessarily have any training uh, in the programs of children or child development or anything of the sort. And uh, there was a question that uh, this hospital for children had several floors with inpatient units uh, which uh, had a capacity of over a hundred, a hundred and twenty children thereabouts. And um, so if you were thinking of assigning two or three children to a specific person in the unit that, of course, alarmed uh, significantly the hospital's administrators because they thought that that will increase the cost of running the unit to a stratospheric <laughs> place. The reality was not that. The reality was that we did not need as many nurses, and a nurse salary was four or five times what uh, a primary care take worker will uh, receive as a salary. Uh, and uh, consequently, by changing the number of staff nurses in every shift, and there were three chiefs, obviously, of eight hours, uh, reducing it significantly. All that was needed was really one nurse to make sure that the administration of medications and so on was done by a person with some expertise in that area. And the rest of the position were transformed into positions for uh, so-called the primary caretakers which did allow in uh, this institution that lies there had a capacity of between 100 and 120 children to implement this program. Now the role of the primary caretaker <coughs> in the life of the children on the ward is based or was based on the one hand on the family model and on the other hand on considerations of the developmental rights and developmental needs of children. Obviously, every attempt must be made to meet these different rights and needs in the somewhat abnormal, to put it mildly, situation of an impatient ward. Those of you that have some familiarity with such impatient wards or children are probably well aware that they can be a nightmare and that the things that happen there hardly will benefit uh, children emotionally and otherwise. So the primary caretaker was completely responsible for the behavior and welfare of these two or three children that were assigned to him. And as you will see, this was during a specific number of hours between 3 o'clock and 11 in the evening, because during the day, the children in the early morning, <coughs> up to 3 o'clock, the children went to school, and uh, school ended at 3, and so the activity in the ward uh, was important until about nine, maybe ten in some occasions and with some children when they were, of course, expected to go to sleep. This arrangement also attempts to take into account the fact that the removal of a child from his family and into an institution poses many dangers for the normal unfolding of the child's developmental potential. These dangers 
and two four. Some come from the separation itself and others are related to the experiences the child may be exposed to in such an institution which experiences are in some occasions really horrendous to put in mind. Thus we have to consider the contradictory situation that while we are attempting to cure, cure in inverted commas, the child of various types of psychopathology, abnormal behaviors and the like, we might be contributing in such institutions to the development of problems in the child as serious, if not more serious than the ones that brought him to us originally. Now, the primary care system rational is as follows. In this new system, the primary caretaker is assigned responsibility for two or three children, as we said, and two or three children only, in a world that may have up to 30 children. Each primary caretaker and his or her two children are conceived of as a small family unit, in inverted commas, family unit, within the world. Since there are as many children per world, as many as 18 to 30, there are as many as 9 or 10 different family units on each world. It is to be expected that not two of these families are alike, just as it happens in the real world. Each family does is a unique organization that must make the necessary adjustment to each other's personalities, character, likes and dislikes, and so on, as well as to the specific behavioral anormalities and psychopathologies of the children. Yet, at the same time, and within as much behavioral and adaptation and flexibility as each family must provide for each of its members, they must set a number of appropriate limits. This is necessary in order to have a smooth and healthy relationship within the family itself as well as with every other family and their members. Similarly, all the families belong in a large social system, the world. Like all societies, the world requires certain regulations to ensure the welfare of all of its members. This must be kept not only by the families as families, but by each one of the members of each family as part of the larger society of the world. The golden rule here is that the rights of any one child or family end at the point when they interfere inappropriately with the rights of the other children all families, the staff generally, and or the institution. In this way, the words reproduce to a reasonable degree the structure and organization of society at large. They are a sort of experimental model of it. More important, this structure offers an excellent opportunity to observe, study, handle, and teach the child the adaptational and interactional skills that he may not have. That lack may have the result, on the one hand, of inappropriate early experiences in the child's life, 
lack of opportunity, lack of education, the disturbed or abnormal family patterns of interaction, the psychopathology of the family as a group, or the psychopathology of the parents as such. On the other hand, the child's lack may be due to the nature of his own pathological conflict, psychological conflict, and needs the nature of the psychopathology, as we said, is developmental conflict, is developmental stage, is age, and so on. In this experimental society of the world, the child is afforded plenty of opportunity to be educated in social manners and social interaction. This educative aspect should not be the mean on the basis that that is not treatment. In fact, this is indeed an essential and integral part of the treatment of the child. They are an important part of raising children, which in this context means using appropriate educational means that help to unfold those developmental processes in the child that hopefully lead to a well-balanced, mature adult capable of living in an appropriate and adaptive manner in any social group. Those children in this environment have the opportunity to learn that there are many other styles of behavior and interactions than those to which they have been exposed so far in their own families or in their own social groups. Many of our children come from backgrounds familiar and societal that do not give much opportunity to learn these skills and thereby to produce positive ego building identifications and ideas that promote human growth, favor the avoidance and all resolution of conflicts, and help to control inappropriate behaviors. Further, the children can see <coughs> in actual life the positive benefits to be derived from the use of these alternative styles of behavior. They can soon identify those modes of behavior and interactional styles that not only give the most pleasure, but yield the most positive results in terms of their own well-being and welfare. In this context, who there are many opportunities for corrective emotional experiences which this system uh, is capable of providing in large amounts and in many areas of the child's life. These uh, corrective emotional experiences tend to favor positive internalization and constructive identification that enrich the personality and facilitate adaptation to society for these very disturbed at times children. Other children's interactional difficulties and behaviors result from a specific conflict and are the natural outcome of the psychopathology. For them, our setting highlights the causative factors, those sibling rivalry, envy, jealousy, and sadistic interactions, Oedipal conflicts, superego defects, 
etc., a offer a context for reasonable and controlled expression. Furthermore, the setting allows the parent supervisor to directly and constantly observe over extended periods of time how the abnormal behavior triggers itself off or evolves around various types of incidents. <clears throat> Such observations are invaluable communications as communications to the child actual therapies who can gain invaluable communications in this way and can gain of course much insight by coupling it with the production of the child during the time and hours of psychotherapy. He or she is thus in a much better position to understand and interpret the behavior and problems of his child. The obvious advantage of the primary care therapy system in this area is that the primary care taker only has to attend to and interact with his or her two or three children not the other 20 or 30 <laughs> children in the world. He concentrates, this is his job, this is who he interacts with and controls behavior, talks, organizes the day for them, uh, outings uh, and the like. Though there is a milieu, as it gets to be called, and in my view a very therapeutic one, it is not a situation where all the members of the milieu tend to take care of and interact with any one of the children for brief periods of time in an indiscriminate manner or according to me, which is what happens outside this particular system that we are describing. In my view, the latter system is less efficient for getting to know the children intimately, providing the kind of emotional climate necessary for the milieu to be therapeutic of providing therapies with consistent, long-term, meaningful observations of a specific child. Now let's uh, talk about the primary caretaker relation to his world. So, The primary caretaker is a permanent member of the staff, generally either a psychiatric nurse or a psychiatric care worker. Attempts should always be made to find a primary caretaker whose personality and character fits the specific children well. Similarly, Appropriate matching of the two or three siblings is highly desirable. All this requires an extensive and detailed clinical evaluation of the children and a good working knowledge of the personality, skills and lacks of those performing the role of primary caretakers and of course 
strong amount of necessary training. And through that, then our primary caretakers <coughs> were selected from students at the university that were looking for uh, a specific uh, job and were interested. They were students of subjects related to psychology, psychopathology, family problems, and things of that kind. So this was something that they welcomed as experience to be gained and something that they had an interest in learning, developing, and being helpful to these children in contrast to the ordinary type of milieu where people do it as a job and don't give much of a hoot about anything else. Usually, the head nurse and the chief of the unit have best working knowledge of the assets and shortcomings of any given staff. The child's assignments to the primary caretaker should generally be a team decision after careful consideration of all the factors and information available. The assigned therapies of the child and his or her supervisor, if there is one, would naturally be involved in the decision making as well. The primary caretaker function is very much that of a parent survey. He organizes the child's day, sets the limits, controls the behavior, and offers the necessary rewards. Like any parent, he is concerned with the behavior and welfare of the child's of the child or children under his care, not only during the hours he or she actually spends with the child, but is concerned about the child's behavior at the school, school lunch hour as well as with his clothing, toys, general health, and so on. In any restrictions, if any restrictions of privilege or punishment are required, he will determine what decide to be, length of time, and so on. Thus, he functions as an ego auxiliary when necessary and plays the role of an ego and super ego idea. Like any parent, he or she also holds the power of rewarding as generously and effusively as required. <coughs> by the child's accomplishment and positive behavior. In other words, he generously rewards such accomplishment on the child's part. After the school hours, the parents of Rubén is constantly available to his two or three children. He stays with them through the dinner period and settles them in bed for the evening. His or her chief, as I mentioned, starts at 3 p.m. and ends at 11.30 p.m. By which time the children have been in bed and have been sleeping for at least one or two hours. Children in the age group we are described, 4 or 5 to 13 years, need the structure provided by a meaningful adult in their life. The younger they are, the more that this is really true. They need clear, consistent, fair, predictable, and age-appropriate limits. Now, none of this is likely to happen in the so-called milieu where nobody is, nobody in the staff is responsible for
for any particular children, while in this type of organization is bound to occur constantly. <clears throat> they need children, the positive rewards, the admiration, affection, and narcissistic supplies that the meaningful adults, usually the parents, must supply to them. They need adults to help master the strong with their own impulses and to keep their behavior within the boundaries of each of such limits when they are unable to do so by themselves. Yet, for all this to happen, as ideally as one can make it possible, it is absolutely fundamental that the adult object available to the child, that is the primary caretaker, to be a constant one, daily and through the week and month of the treatment. The more objects that share the care of the child, obviously the less consistent and intimate the relationship to the one adult is. The more we are departing <coughs> from those ideal conditions necessary to ensure not only the therapeutic climate but also the type of relationship and environment in which children development thrives. The more the role of the primary caretaker is diluted and distributed among several members of the staff and happen in a milieu where all the staff take care of all the children, which means none of the staff take care of really anyone in many cases in an appropriate manner. So, the more, as I was saying, the role of the primary caretaker is diluted and distributed among several members of the staff, the less effective the system will become. Unfortunately, it is not only that the system becomes less effective, it can in fact become detrimental to the welfare of the child and his best developmental interest. Systems that do not take the above as one of the basic rules for inpatient services for children are not effective and may will be very damaging for them. <clears throat> Briefly then, the emotional growth, character development and general well-being of a child up to the end of the latency stage requires a satisfactory interaction with a meaningful, constant adult, one that the child admires, values, and preferably develops some affection for. That person is, in fact, the catalyst that sustains not only growth, but the development of those controls that are necessary for living in an organized society. He is also one of the essential motivational sources of the behavior of the child. For example, a child will tend not to follow the pleasure principle as blindly as he would for much of the time only because his meaningful adult will be distressed if he does. In return, the child expects affection, support, admiration, and genuine concern. Fortunately, the meaningful adult's influence on the child grows so large in the emotional feeling 
tone of the child that the latter is more than willing to accept limits, renounce gratifications, or postpone them, accept deprivations, etc., for the sake of the value object. In short, human beings are educable because in the competition between instincts and objects, objects end end up by gaining the upper hand, but only if these objects are appropriately valued and behave in a manner that promotes that outcome. So that means that they have to become significant to the child. It follows them that the primary caretaker system relies heavily on these characteristics and developmental needs of children, it relies too on the fact that in the absence of its primary object, the child is willing to accept a substitute that is a parent surrogate, which happens in many situations when children go to a nursery school, go to school, etc. Uh, these people will become parents surrogates in one way or another if they have the right kind of attitude to the child. Now the system relies too on the fact that in an inpatient unit, given the access of the primary object of the child, the child is willing to accept a substitute, a parent surrogate, which as you know happens, as I said, when they go to nursery school or to school, etc. Clearly then, the primary caretaker's essential task is to make himself or herself valuable and meaningful to the child. This implies that the primary caretaker must elicit as many as possible of the positive transferential elements of which the child is capable. The process is very much facilitated in an impatient setting by the fact that the child is away from his parents or other figures in his life or her life. And if there were none, we are in the privileged position of providing them for the first time, thus fulfilling some of the most basic rights and needs of the child. In this respect, the objection is raised that we are giving such children a temporary heaven from which they will have to return to a devastating home situation, for example. At least in some cases, this is certainly the case. Nevertheless, we should no longer forget that the child is right in the middle of his or her developmental <coughs> processes. For this reason, a period of time in an environment that promotes the personality growth along the right path may be invaluable to the child's future. The corrective emotional experience he will be exposed to may well show him alternative that he may one day take. This could be so if the total experience was a treasure one that led to growth in some important areas. Children come into this relationship like an organic chemical compound with an open balance. As such chemicals do, the child will strongly link himself with the right compound, the right person, since this, in fact, 
is a developmental imperative for him at this point in life. The linkage will not happen automatically, but because the child has a need. The primary caretaker must earn the attachment through his attitude or her attitude toward the child and his interactions or her interactions with him. Beyond a general positive attitude toward children, there are other things favoring the establishment of a meaningful relationship, the ability to come down to the level, to be sensitive to their needs, the ability to be flexible and yet firm, the capacity to become genuinely interested in the child's activities, the capacity to play with him, the capacity to love him without becoming seductive, the ability to be flexible and fair, the ability to see the child as a person in his own right, and the ability to respect the child's idiosyncrasies within reasonable and acceptable limits. Since the primary caretaker is given the most influential role in the child's life, he can use this position to great advantage. He or she can gratify or deny the wishes of the child and negotiate on his behalf with other staff, including the therapist. He is the child's advocate in relation to things and situations that are of interest to the child. In addition, the primary caretaker takes the child out into the community after school hours for activities and functions that are highly desirable and pleasurable for the child. As far as possible, this should be done as a family and not in large groups. On occasion, of course, two or three families can go together, as happens commonly in real life, to the movies, roller skating, bicycling, to a park, a museum, to a job, etc. This helps further enhance the importance and value of the primary caretaker in the child's eyes. As such, it helps to develop and cement the relationship. Other Devices used for these purposes are, for example, a weekly allowance. The child receives it from his primary caretaker, which is provided by the family. He can spend it on toys, candies, or in any other way he likes, as long as he has the approval and cooperation of his parents to row it. You are well aware that none of this is what happened in the so-called milieu, in the ordinary uh, institution for the children that need hospitalization. Like in any sensible family, all the above pleasurable activities and privileges are in some measure related to the child's behavior and accomplishment. They are extra rewards for his positive behaviors and achievements and consequently tend to be positive reinforcers of behaviors that are desirable and interactions. By the same token, these activities can be restricted, limited, or regulated in constructive ways 
by the parents who provide as part of the educational and therapeutic approach to the child. As the relationship between the child and the parents' survey develops, the latter becomes more and more capable of stopping or aborting negative behavior by means of a glance, by calling the child's name, or by a simple look of concern, displeasure, or even disappointment. The stronger the positive ties that have developed between the child and the primary caretaker, the easier, the easier it becomes to set appropriate limits in the behavior of the child without massive, restrictive, and quite negative intervention. It will be obvious that since the child spends most of his time in the milieu the nature and quality of his experience are a vital and integral part of his developmental and therapeutic progress as well as of his therapeutic plan. Most of the children are in one or another form of uncovering psychotherapy two, three and occasionally more times a week. Psychotherapy aims at dealing with the conflicts and psychopathological structures acquired up to that point in the child's life. It aims at the resolution of fixation points, at the undoing of regressions, at the interpretative analysis of maladaptive defenses, etc. The effectiveness and value of this effort may be undermined if the child's support structures fail to meet developmental requirements. If they keep the child in a continuous anxiety state, because of lack of appropriate controls over the conditions of life in the world that expose the child to negative interactions and possibly traumas. In such a setting, psychotherapy aims at revolving and resolving the child's problems is no more capable of success than it could be in a chaotic, disorganized, and unpredictable family environment. Yet, as we all know, unless maximum care is exercised, an impatient world can become nightmarish, unsettled, dehumanized, and chaotic. When that occurs, many among the children and some among the senior staff may be living in constant fear of what might happen next. In some more extreme cases, many of the children and some of the staff may be living in a state that approaches a permanent panic with all the negative consequences that such an environment will have on children and even adults. Constant questions are being asked as to who is going to explode next or to become aggressive, abusive or destructive, or what is going to be destroyed, or who is going to be hurt and how badly, and so on. Frequent trips to the emergency room at such times testify to the reality of such fears, at least before we change over to the primary caretaker system. Two or three trips to the emergency room 
ਕੋਈ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਅਗੇਨ ਜ਼ਾਬਾਕ ਦਾ ਸਾਈਕੋਥੈਰਾਪੀ ਇਸ ਇਨ ਮਾਈ ਵਿਊ ਨੈਕਸਟ ਟੂ ਇੰਪੋਸਟ ਦੇ ਸੇਮ ਇਸ ਟਰੂ ਆਫ ਐਨ ਯੋਗਰ ਫੋਰਮ ਆਫ ਟ੍ਰੀਟਮੈਂਟ ਨਾਉ ਲੈਟਸ ਇੰਪੋਰਟੈਂਟ ਇਨ ਆਲ ਥਿਸ ਕਨਸੀਡਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਇਸ ਦ ਫੈਕਟ ਦੈਟ ਚਿਲਡਰਨ ਐਮ ਮੋਰ ਸਪੈਸ਼ਲੀ ਸੋ ਦੇ ਯੋਗਰ ਵਾਂਸ ਹੂ ਕਮ ਟੂ ਅਸ ਫੋਰ ਅ ਵੈਰਾਈਟੀ ਆਫ ਕੰਪਲੈਕਸ ਐਂਡ ਰੀਸੋਰਸ ਹੈਵ ਨੋਟ ਅਸ ਯੈਟ finish the developmental process when the contrary they are very actively engaged in such a process they are still a structure in their character and personalities making constant identifications learning new adaptive techniques new ego skills establishing ego and super ego ideas moral active defense and so on but for this development to continue to take place as ideal as possible in such circumstances certain minimal conditions must be present the milieu the world and the parents who provide must provide the right climate the necessary holding environment the right structure a structure in short they must meet the child developmental needs and rights efficiently at the same time they must remove quickly and as completely as possible all those factors and negative influence that are potentially serious obstacle to the adequate unfolding of the different developmental paths that must remain open to the child. It is clear that the child's development will continue to take place on the world where we want it or not. The question is in which way and of what quality. the conditions in the artificial holding environment constituted by the world and the quality of the experience with the human objects and especially the primary caretaker will determine if that development is going to follow the desirable and favorable routes or undesirable and unfavorable ones it is this very fact that one of the greatest strengths of the inpatient treatment of children lies it can remove a child from an unfavorable in the developmental sense environmental situation and place him in a much more favorable one thus the dangers implicit in separating a child from his object can be turned at times into a valuable asset. Let's now move to the next question. That is the word liaison as the primary caretaker. I would not attempt to the final describe in detail of the inpatient system but only mention a few of the salient aspects in any case it is not a simple task to describe social system they evolve through many years partly as a result of planning based in certain legitimate assumptions and theoretical tenets and experience and partly in an unplanned manner through the actual experiences on the service through apathy, dissatisfactions in the staff and the thousand and one other factors that determine changes in any social system. Let alone, as we mentioned earlier, that sometimes this occurs in a business setting with all the implications that that will have i am aware 
that the following description may be somewhat biased because of my own theoretical orientation, that I do not consider other system to be good enough goes without saying since I have changed ours and reorganize it as speedily as I could. I should add that no particular criticism is implied of any other system for running impatient words for children. It is indeed quite conceivable that a few years hence another psychiatrist will be looking perhaps not in very favorable terms of the primary caretaker approach, for which I must assume full responsibility. In other systems, the emphasis is on the surface, but frequently only on the surface, not all that different than the primary caretaker approach. The children are assigned to therapies for the formal treatment of the presenting disturbance at the same time that somebody on the ward may be assigned as the child staff person. This person is generally called the ward liaison of the child. The main and most significant difference from the primary caretaker system is that the relationship between the ward liaison and the child is from the start extremely loose or can easily become so. And it is not based on a careful, very careful consideration of the developmental needs of children. In actual practice, this staff person may not be available to the child consistently and for most of the needed time, and of course is assigned a large number of other children. The work, the action person is assigned as well a variety of tasks on the ward, which clearly will prevent him or her from interacting with the child regularly and consistently on a day-to-day -day basis. This excludes the degree of closeness that is essential in the primary caretaker system in order to meet the developmental needs of children and to accomplish the many other aims that we have described earlier. The word liaison is frequently loosely defined as somebody the child could go to, but not a parent sooner away, having complete responsibility for the life of the, the life of the child on every detail while on the unit. And of course, as I mentioned, it does happen that many are assigned to too many children. Now we move to the next lecture called the therapeutic milieu. There is another system strong emphasis on the effect of the whole milieu on the child. The therapeutic milieu is expected to affect a significant influence on the child and to help bring about the desired changes in him. There can be no question as to the essential therapeutic role played by the milieu in the life of the child in such a situation. Indeed, as we will see in the second lecture on this subject, the primary caretaker system relies heavily on its curative value. What has to be clearly understood 
is an assembly of professional people, however well intentioned, does not by itself constitute a therapeutic environment and milieu. They most certainly constitute a milieu, but one that in spite of its good will may in actual fact be detrimental to the children. For a milieu to be truly therapeutic, it must have a certain structure that is itself finally tuned to the developmental rights and needs of the children as we have described before. Each one of its member roles must be a strictly decline in terms of interaction and function with a specific children, with the whole group of children on the ward, and with the other members of the staff. Unless constant and special care is exercised, the milieu becomes a theoretical myth under which can hide the fact that the situation may have degenerated into some term of loosely structured group care for the children. In that case, the system may have partly or wholly lost the ability to care for the individual needs of each of the children. I must emphasize that group care for children, which tends to deprive him of a very close, consistent, and sustaining relationship with a meaningful adult, is highly detrimental for the child in most cases. In my view, an approach should not be considered a second best. as is frequently done, except in the most extraordinary circumstances. I mean, such approach should not be considered a second best. We only need to be reminded, for example, of the devastating effect that orphanage, where such conditions attain, had on children. And that concludes today's lecture. There will be a second part where we will be further describing and defining the primary caretaker system and their advantages. Here you have a slide about the Carter Jenkins Center. And <coughs> if you visit our website you will find a large number of lectures on mental health uh, by distinguished, very distinguished group of psychoanalysts and psychiatrists. If again, if you have any question, please address it to me. Thank you very much for your attention.